All right, I'm I'm Emily. For those of you who don't know me, she, her, um, and I'm here at the museum uh, as a postdoc. Um, and I was brought here because, as Tyler says, I'm the croc. I'm the croc guy. Uh, so for my dissertation work, which I'll talk to you some some about that today, I studied reptile sensory evolution with a focus on crocs. And then here I'm studying some fossil crocs from Corral Bluffs. Uh, and I brought a bunch of things with me. And I'd rather you interrupt me in the middle if you have any questions, but you can also ask them at the end. So here we go. Um, let's see. When you think of crocs, you probably think of living crocs. And they're pretty sweet. Uh, there's, depending on who you ask, 23 to 27 species. Uh, this changes all the time. And these fall into the groups known as alligatorids, crocodilids, and then gavialids. So um, alligatorids are these broad, blunt-snouted things, um, generally crocodilids, are long-snouted things. And we talk to children. We point out things like when an alligator has its mouth closed, you can't see its teeth. Um, when a crocodile has its mouth closed, you can see its teeth. I like to tell them that uh, if it's chasing you, it's a croc, a, a crocodile, and if you're chasing it, it's probably an alligator. Alligators tend to be pretty nice, nice. Um, and then gavialids are these really long snouted things. They generally just eat fish. Uh, you probably won't come across them in the wild because they don't live here. Um, and I, I'm talking about crocodilians here, and to me, that word means more than just those guys, um, and I'll take you through that. Um, and I'm going to share several things with you today. Um, I'm going to share how they use their nerves to maximize uh, navigation of a semi-aquatic environment, um, how they develop to get to the point where they can do that. And then my work here is how uh, you as a croc and your friends can survive a mass extinction event just fine. Um, scientists are people, so this is me. I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, and then I thought about it. I thought it about uh, thought about it a lot, uh, and I was like, "No, nah, never mind. Vets have owners. I don't want to work with owners." So I was a biology major, and then a geology major, and then people took me out to the fields and showed me the dirt and the mud, and yeah, that's that's me today. I've gotten to do a lot of fun things. Um, I get to go to museums. I get to photograph really, really big crocs. I get to put my hands inside of crocodilians, um, saw their faces off, play with embryos. Um, this one's fun. I'm at the Field Museum, and they gave me these, these forceps. And in that tank down there, there's uh, like full crocs. Um, I get to talk to kids. Uh, I get to work with CT scans and all sorts of imaging stuff. And I get to go out in the field. This is uh, what got me into crocodilians and croc fossils to begin with. I had a summer internship out at Petrified Forest National Park, uh, which you might know for its petrified wood. Um, but actually, this is a very, very, very rich fossil site from the Triassic period. And the Triassic period is um, when the croc ancestors, ancestors start uh, to take over. So animals that are found at Petrified Forest include all these things. Um, and the majority of them are crocodilian ancestors, uh, they, at this time, pretty much anything that, uh, any dinosaur you can think of had a crocodilian uh, analog. Um, and these are, they're small, they're large, they're spiky. Uh, some of them, like these guys, look just like crocs from today, but they're actually the most distantly related things that we still consider uh, more closely related to crocodilians than birds. Uh, the landscape at the time of the Triassic looked like this uh, in petrified forest. So it was this big river environment. All these creatures were running around. Um, and almost everything you see here is a crocodilian ancestor. There's some dinosaurs and mammalian precursors in there as well. But they aren't as cool. So again, you might think of these. Um, and I want to talk to you about uh, where these fit evolutionarily in a phylogeny in a, in a tree. Um, so, if you think about all these animals up here, hopefully, is anyone very unfamiliar with something like this? That's great. 
All right, so common ancestor of all these things had jaws, right? So we're going to work our way up to archosaurs, the best fossils, um, and then pseudosuchians, the even better best fossils. All these things had jaws, then they got legs, which is great. Um, then they got eggs, which is even cooler. Uh, so then they were able to inhabit land, and then we've got this group, crocodilians and birds. And that group is called Archosauria, um, and includes crocs, birds, and all their common ancestors, which is these fossils up here, and all those pictures I showed you, and uh, dinosaurs, dinosaurs. These take a number of forms. So here's where they diverge, down here. So the early archosaurs were like lizardy looking things, um, and then they got pretty crazy with their body plans. Um, and uh, unfortunately, all we were left with was this one, because I would like to see some of these, I think. The features that make an archosaur are largely up here in the skull. So they have an antorbital fenestra, they have a mandibular fenestra. So those are just holes in the jaws, which allow for muscle attachments. Um, and then the difference between uh, the groups that split into birds and crocs are largely the ankle joint. So the pseudosuchians, which is what the crocodilian lineage, lineage is called, and when I'm talking about crocs and croc fossils, I'm talking about pseudosuchia. They have this crotarsal ankle joint, so sometimes they're called uh, crotarsins, um, and the hinge is here, um, and then that's uh, Ornithodira is the dinosaur line, the bird line, and their hinge is just in a little bit of a different place. In the Triassic period, so here's the Triassic period, right about 228 million years ago is when archosaurs started to really, really explode. And this was largely those, it says Kurotarsins, so the Sukian fossils, the croc fossils. Um, during the Triassic, they were all over the place. They took a huge number of body forms. Um, until the Jurassic period, this end Triassic extinction. So here's the end Triassic extinction. Um, what you can see here, these are all uh, members of the croc family. They do extend all the way up to the KPG boundary, so that's when the asteroid hit. Um, they seem to do just fine. There's lots and lots of these animals. And if you look after the boundary up there, uh, only a couple make it through. The ones that are around between the two extinction events were, were um, super diverse too. Um, your friendly neighborhood, Zemosuchus, which hopefully all of you recognize, was one of these guys. It falls into this Notosuchian group, which is a super diverse group of land crocs. Yeah, land crocs. They could be in the water and on land. So I spent a lot of time looking at these animals and looking at these trees, and something caught my eye about these. So here's the croc tree, and in green, you've got the terrestrial crocs. Um, in blue is marine, and in black is freshwater. So hopefully you notice that right there, something happens. So in the mid-Jurassic period, though there are a bunch of these animals that continue to live on land, there's a big transition. And then a lot of them start to inhabit these freshwater environments. So that caught my eye, um, and I became pretty interested in that. So if you look at living crocs, what you're seeing here is they're dropping a pellet of food into the water. And this is a completely dark room. They didn't give it earplugs, but the spoiler is they don't use their ears for this. Um, it's able to orient itself to that little pellet without um, any visual input. So it's using solely tactile uh, input. And all living crocs can do this. There's a cooler video next. Um, I became really interested in when evolutionarily they would have been able to do this. It seems like a specialization for a semi-aquatic environment. Um, so that's why that transition on that tree was really interesting. Did they get this ability before they went into the environment? This is with water droplets. So next time you go in a pool, have your friend stand on the other side and drop some water in and tell me if you can feel it with your face. You can't. <laughs> so they do the sweeping thing, so the, the ball moves a little bit, and it's sensing the rebound of the waves coming back from the ball. I don't know why it wants to eat the ball, though.
Anyway, that's neat. All right, so that was, the, that was my dissertation. I decided that I wanted to figure out when evolutionarily they could figure this out. So again, all crocodilians can use their faces to detect movements in the water, um, and they did transition to an aquatic environment at some point. So were they able to do this um, as a means to use the water very effectively, or, or what? Uh, the way they're doing this is through a nerve called the trigeminal nerve. So if you touch your face, um, that's your trigeminal nerve is sending the signals back into your brain. So we've got one of these. Uh, all vertebrates have one of these. So we're all doing this the same way. And that mediates the sense of touch in the face and also controls the jaw musculature, which the rest of my uh, lab worked on. They worked on musculature and I did nerves. All the signals go back to this trigeminal ganglion up near the brain. And there's three divisions. One does the upper face. One does the upper lip, and one does the lower face. Um, surprise, reptiles have this too, so I'll demonstrate this to you in a croc. So in blue is the brain, and in yellow is the nerves. Um, there's that ganglion up there. If we take a slice through the skull of the croc and we turn it towards you, um, there's that big ganglion down there in yellow. They've got an ophthalmic division to their eyes, maxillary to their maxilla or upper jaws, and mandibular to their mandible and lower jaws. Um, I decided to focus on this mandibular division uh, because if you look back here, th all this is doing is it's going to the jaw muscles and then it's simply going into the lower jaw and that's it. Uh, these divisions, there's like a ton of sinus up there. Uh, there's eyeballs in the way. So it's just a pretty complicated system. It shoots off a lot of branches that aren't necessarily going to those receptors in the face. So I decided to ignore them. Um, and here, across a bunch of different reptiles, some birds, a snake, uh, a croc and an iguana, I started to look into how these nerves pass through the lower jaw bones and get out to the face. Um, in all of these animals, they terminate in receptors. So if you take a look at any living croc or recently dead croc, it's probably safer. They've got those little pigmented dots. And those are the actual receptors that the nerve goes to. Those are the things that are picking up the signal from the environment and allowing them to do those cool things and catch their food and find each other. Luckily, in reptiles, the nerves and soft tissues leave bony correlates. Um, so the ganglion passes out a really nice hole in the brain case of the croc. So that's a measurable feature. The, the third division of the nerve passes through a hole into the lower jaw, and then it also passes out a whole bunch of holes in the lower jaw before going to those receptors. Um, unfortunately, in things like whiskered animals, which also use their trigeminal nerve for their whiskers, they don't have that system. So it's a little bit trickier to study and reptiles make a pretty good group to study this feature in. Um, let's see. We can, you can notice similarities between crocodilians and other animals that also are highly tactile. So if you've ever watched a duck feeding, it's doing this thing with its beak um, and it's actually using a highly packed end of its beak. You know, these little blue things are nerves that pass through these holes out to the Rampatheca to uh, filter out tiny particles from the water. So um, exploring these, you notice there might be some similarities. Um, and then um, using CT imaging, which I'll give you a little walk through in a second, was a lot easier to look at these than this clearing and staining method because uh, um, it's a lot easier to rotate things in 3D and I couldn't get the nerves out of my jaws when I was studying them this way. Um, so here's more examples of CT imaging. Let's you take slices through things as well. And then CT imaging was also useful because I could image the canals of fossil animals. So there's you're looking at the bottom of Simasugus's chin right there. Um, and there's a Tyrannosaurus. I should have taken all the dinosaurs out, but it's a nice image. So most of my CT scanning for this project was done uh, at University of Texas and some of it at University of Missouri. And then I borrowed some scans for some other people. So they have this really cool scanner that's the size of from here to here. And you can go in there and you can put giant things in there like croc skulls 
Um, and then usually what a CT image generates is something like this. You get your image of your animal and then the bone. Um, but since I was using living animals to validate some of these things, I use this method called DiceCT. So you take your uh, recently dead animal and you dunk in it a bunch of iodine. And please hold. Um, when you do that, the iodine bonds to anything with a lipid in it. So all these soft tissue, tissue structures. So we're going down through the skull of an alligator right now. Uh, this is its brain. These are its eyeballs that are about to come in. Uh, all this is jaw muscles. We gotta go back to the nerves. Hold on, they're the coolest. And then these are what I'm after. So these, these are the nerves going to the lower jaws and they pop really bright. Uh, so using this dice CT method on um, a variety of reptiles, I was able to explore those. And then this can be applied to the fossils too. So the fossils do the bull scan like this. You'll see the outline of the dirt or the matrix or whatever's in it and then the bone. Um, if you've seen CT scans in our lab, they're really, really bad examples of uh, what this might look at because our fossils here are way harder to work with than the fossils I was working with. So there is hope for everyone. Uh, <laughs> So I wanted to develop a method to explore how these nerves pass through the lower jaws. Uh, and to do this, I took these CAT scans of these animals and I made these ball and stick models of the nerves as they pass through in those crazy branch patterns. Um, and I assigned a bunch of numbers to them. Uh, I, it's, this technique is called ordering and I didn't develop it myself, but I adapted it to quantify these structures. Um, it's, it was pretty tedious. Um, but kind of fun, and it's actually used uh, by geography folks and people who study rivers and streams to quantify uh, waterways. Um, I'm gonna share one of these methods with you today. There's like a bunch of different ways to number these, but this one is the most fun to look at the results of. So um, if you haven't picked it up yourself, you start at the beginning. So this is where the nerve goes into the lower jaw, and at each split, uh, you go up a number until you get to the end. So then you have this set of numbers. And what do we do with numbers? We graph them. Okay, so <laughs> what you're seeing on this axis on the bottom is where along the canal the branches come off. And then this axis is how many of those there are. So this peak up here, that's sixes. There's a lot of sixes. So a lot of these branches come off six sevenths along the length of the canal. How's everyone feel about that? Good, okay. All right, so in a simple creature, not all of them branch the same. So something like an iguana, it's got this canal that has these six branches, well, seven branches come off and they're incremental along the length of the canal, one at a time, no, no complex branching. It's gonna look like that. And then something like a croc, it's got all these branches coming off and some of those branches branch and some of those branches branch. It's gonna look something like that. It has a lot of branches and they come off all over. So I applied this to a bunch of animals across the reptile tree and um, most of these were living animals because to really understand behaviors in fossil animals, we have to validate them in what we see in the world around us. So thinking about the, we got lizards, we got a bunch of birds um, and we got crocs. Um, and the reason I did these animals is because within them, we know that uh, these crocs are extremely tactile animals. They're using this trigeminal system to do a lot of things. Um, and then there are examples of birds, uh, probing birds do this to search for food, Bur uh, ducks dabble and in search of food. And then um, parrots, if you've ever watched a parrot, it's using its beak as a, another hand, so their trigeminal system is also uh, super 
large and complicated. Um, and then also there's examples of animals that aren't tactile, aren't using this trigeminal nerve for this purpose. Um, and what this does is it creates a really good bracket for the fossil crocs that I was interested in. So those are here. We've got tactile animals on this side, and we've got tactile and non-tactile animals on this side, all representing the common ancestor. So what this is called is an extant phylogenetic bracket uh, to study the fossil animals. All right. So I already showed you the lizards. That's pretty. That's what a non-tactile animal would look like. Um, and this is what all the crocodilian, crocodilians look like. The birds are a mix. Um, some of them are pretty simple. Uh, I think this is a pheasant uh, canal, and then this is a duck canal. So a lot of their uh, nerve tips are concentrated on the end. Um, an archosauromorph, so an early ancestor of both crocs and birds, looks like that. So it's a little more complex than a lizard, but way less than anything else. Um, and then, unfortunately, there's dinosaurs in here. But you can see, looking at this pink line, there is some complexity there. It is much more than these lizards and that early member, um, that pre archosaur So quantifying this, um, using some statistics, basically, I, I took this and I binned, it, I binned them in a series of 10 to determine where along the canal the complexity was. Um, and I compared this um, and dropped it into a tree. So remember, I'm looking mid-Jurassic. I'm trying to figure out if right here is the time that this happened or before or after. OK. So here, here's mid-Jurassic. And the colors here, um, the animals we know are tactile, the crocodilians, the extant crocodilians, are down here. They're really, really, really bright colors. Um, and then using these statistics on those plots that I showed you earlier, um, I got a predicted value for how tactile these animals were in comparison with the birds, the lizards, and the living crocs. So dark colors are these non-tactile animals. The point that it, I did this in percentages, so the point where it, it, it jumped from 0 to 50 was right about there. Uh, and then what you can see is the colors do go from that non-tactile dark to that tactile light. So we are seeing an increase in tactile senses um, as we get closer and closer to our extant animals. What's interesting is that this jump right here, all these animals that come after it, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, they're all terrestrial. So all these terrestrial animals did have some sort of uh, predicted increase in ability to use that nerve um, before, that before that transition to the aquatic environment. People always ask me to, to tell them why, and I always say no. Um, <laughs> the only explanation I can come up with, like there are terrestrial animals that do use their faces. Um, basically, it's just those probing birds. Um, so the only thing I can think of is that their faces are in contact with the ground a lot. Um, if maybe it has to do with some grubbing behavior. But it could also just have happened. Plenty of evolutionary things just happen, and then animals capitalize on them. So it might be that these, uh, the groups that led up to the living crocodilians just capitalized on this um, extreme amount of nerves in their faces. All right, any questions on that? Yeah, star nose. I you see my head's in my head's in reptile land. So, <laughs> yeah, there are plenty of mammals that are using this nerve to do things. So rats, rats do that whisking thing, and they sense uh, width width of what they're traveling through. They're using the nerve. Star nose moles can sense vibrations of um, earthworms and insects on underground. Um, there's the tentacled snake. No, that's in the water. Anyway, yeah. All right, so. No evolutionary story is complete without understanding the development of a system. Uh, this is this was a really complex thing, so I've got I just have a couple of slides on this to talk to you about development um, and how these animals developed the system. So ontogeny is the study of development, um, and you might wonder why would we ever study development um, when we're thinking about fossils? Well, there are two reasons. 
Um, one of these is that development can show us when stru uh, if structures appear for an animal at all, and it can also tell us uh, when those might appear. So, this is a lizard and a snake. This one's the snake. I don't know why they don't have its body in this image. I didn't make it, but uh, it's a lovely paper. Um, and this is an example I used to use, I like to use um, when talking about why studying development. So um, maybe you know that uh, lizards and snakes are very closely related. Holger knows. Um, and when we talk about the group squamates, it includes snakes right in the middle. So snakes are lizards that lost their legs, to put it. Simply, and by studying development, these people figured out that these structures in red, they developed a lot slower in these animals. And what that did is it resulted in that squished face and reduced limbs, which led to snakes. So I hoped to find something when I was studying crocodilians that would cue me in on something like this. Again, I was interested in that. Uh, oh was interested in this question. So what I did was I drove down to Louisiana, slept, woke up, went to the, the Rockefeller Wildlife Refuge. They said, here's three crates of eggs. Um, they terminated some alligators for us. We put them in the car. The, the eggs were in these uh, cages, like this big, with hay. We rented a minivan. We drove 15 hours straight back to, to Missouri because um, these guys needed to get into an incubator. At that point, they were all like, I think they were all about eight days post laying. And we put them in an incubator. And then through the next, uh, what is that, 63 days, we terminated them. Um, and here they are. They're really cute. And the stars are the ones that I collected for this project. Um, and then I use the same imaging processes. These animals are really small, so the stain goes into them really super well. Um, but they're also very susceptible to chemicals. So the first one I put in, um, it turned into a little pancake. It just like completely compressed and became flat. And then I figured out if you embed them in a gel, they, uh, they stay nice and fluffy. Um, and then I got some really cool things like this. So here I just am going to show you the, the brain and the trigeminal nerve. Um, I actually worked, uh, I have models of all of the cranial nerves and all of the musculature associated with them, which is super cool. Um, but you can see as the animal, this is chronological, as the animals grow, their brain elongates, um, their nerves start really big and stay really big, um, and they elongate. So a lot of this is just, Nothing uh, new, it's just a response of the growing skull of the animal. All right, so this is a comparison of all of the cranial nerves. Um, oddly, the fifth one, the trigeminal nerve, is this pink one. Um, so what they do is they just start off with a really big uh, nerve. The second they're born, they, or the second they are laid, they have a really big nerve. Um, and it also shows the highest growth rate. So if we look at the slope of these lines, um, only the a couple other nerves have similar slopes. So it starts really large, and it grows much faster than the others. That's all. <laughs> There's a lot of really complicated things that have to do with how the skull grows around the nerve in response to this high growth rate that just really isn't worth standing up here and talking to you about. All right, so next I'm going to bring you to the work that I'm working on here. So um, luckily, this trigeminal system is part of what allows these animals to survive the max, mass extinction event. So that's a nice transition for you. All right, so when we think about the extinction, as Tyler would say, single worst day in history for all life on Earth. Um, it wasn't the single worst day in history for all life on Earth because these guys did just fine, right? And Tyler's favorite. So we got turtles that make it through this extinction. We got crocs. We got lizards. We got birds. And we got mammals. 
All right, there's the extinction. Um, and the, if you look at this, you might say, hey, but what about all these groups? In the grand scheme of things, um, there was actually just a decline in diversity before the extinction. So a lot of these groups were on their way to going extinct. So it's a no big deal. Um, the, the crocodilian groups that, I'm, that I've got up here today, they made it through that boundary with no, no impact. Um, they didn't, what they didn't do is they didn't experience that huge radiation uh, that the crocs did in the, in the Triassic-Jurassic boundary where they like exploded in diversity and we see all these landforms. Instead, by that point, um, except for these groups, everything's becoming that low semi-aquatic terrestrial croc that we're familiar with today. Um, and they do diversify a little bit after the extinction. We're gonna talk about animals right there. But first, how do you make it through an asteroid impact? Just in case, everyone. Uh, the first thing that's gonna happen is it's gonna get really hot, um, and there's gonna be an infrared blast. So, it, when it hits, you gotta get underwater, or you can hunker down in some brush, or you gotta go into a hole. Crocs are really good at that, they do that. Um, the other things that happen afterwards is the temperature goes up and down. It's a pretty crazy time. Um, but I was reading about this, and it wasn't much more than temperatures fluctuate today. Um, and crocs can actually do weird things like hang out underwater, under ice with their snouts up, and not eat for a long time. And they are pretty tolerant to changing conditions. Uh, they can also not eat for three years um, in extreme Examples, and I think not drank for nine months, so they don't, they they uh, were just fine. Uh, they also eat a lot of things, so when there's uh, food scarcity, they can pick up anything and and be fine with it. The crocs from here are from the Denver Basin. Maybe you've seen this before. Um, so Denver's up here. Um, we go down to Corral Bluffs down here, and that's where these fossils are from. Uh, and it's a lot of outcrop, and it represents a million years right after the asteroid hit. So it's a super unique place to study how these animals uh, made it through that boundary. We find these concretions um, out here. Luckily, Tyler cracked the code, um, and we have uh, really nice prepared fossils. Not the easiest. This is a cool video. This fossil's up here. Mm, it's not up here. One very close to this fossil is up here, and you can look at it at the end if you want. Boop. Okay. So from this site, we have two different types of these crocs. We got this one, and we got this one. So come look at them after. We can hold them carefully together. The first one I showed you, there's only a couple of them. Um, and it comes from 65 and a half million years ago. The third one, there's a whole bunch of them. And they come from right, anywhere from right after the extinction to uh, across the whole outcrop. Um, there's no reason to expect that the, the first one only comes from then. We just haven't found it yet. Um, and from the tree, if you're interested in trees, Here's where one comes from, and the other is part of this group that it's a mess. It's kind of a fun puzzle. So this is what that one looks like. His name is Borealisuchus. We got a couple fossils from there, and that's where they would fit. Um, and I get to do fun things like figure out what every single skull bone looks like and how it differs from every other known Borealisuchus. Um, and I do that uh, both through investigating the actual fossils and then using CT scans of them. So some things um, in this image aren't uh, either are too difficult to prepare out, um, not worth preparing out if we know we can scan them, or this is really crumbly if you look at it in person, but the CT scan shows that below the surface there's some preserved structures. The spoiler, this is an animal called Borealisuchus sternbergi probably. And the green represents our animal. So right here is the asteroid. Um, and what our, an what our animal does is it extends the range of this animal across that extinction event. So another species that we know made it through. Um, as far as location, 
uh, before the extinction is these two colors. Um, they're located all up and down the seaway, um, and then they kind of maintain that pattern afterwards. And the one that we have um, fills in a gap between the southernmost and uh, all the others. So it's likely there are more, uh, probably from New Mexico too. All right, this other animal is a button tooth croc, and I'm not gonna give you a name for it because I haven't decided. Um, but when I talk about button teeth, um, they have these really, really round globe teeth in the backs of their mouths. We have a lot of these. We have full bodies of these. Um, I can't pick that one up safely, so come look at that one too. That's the one in the corner. Um, and this poses a fun problem that I'm gonna run through really fast because it's fun to do that way. So in 1921, this guy named this group of crocs with these button teeth Alanathosuchus, and in 1930, they found this one and decided to call it Alanathosuchus mukai. In 1942, they found this one, Navajosuchus novo mexicanus, and in 1982, they found this one named Wanaganosuchus brachymanus. Got it? Okay, then in 1992, wait, this one's really cute. This is from Harvard, they mailed it to me. They found this guy. And they decided that it was also an Alanathosuchus mukai. Then in 2004, this guy who knows a lot about these decided that these three were the same animal. And since Alanathosuchus was a name given to like 15 species across 15 million years, we should just call all of those Navajosuchus mukai instead. And then I came along and I decided that these are the same and the one in the middle is different. So I don't know what to call it. Um, but that'll get figured out later. This one's different. All right. Anyway, um, we have the earliest recorded example of this animal. Um, they've only been found after the extinction event and we have one that is right up to the extinction event. So that's pretty neat. Um, and then we also uh, again, we're filling a range gap, so our animal falls out here. It's pretty neat. And then this got me thinking, ignore the colors here. They don't match across. Um, this got me thinking, what's up with this? So we got these, this Borealisuchus, the first one I showed you, and we have this other animal um, in the same place at the same time over millions of years. So how do different animals that how do very similar animals occupy the same space at the same time? And if we look at how um, all of our living crocs are distributed across the world, it turns out that actually up to six species can live in the same place at the same time, which is pretty neat. Uh, and they do this in a couple different ways. So I was, I've been looking at these, trying to figure out how ours might do it. All right, one way is that they might, some might burrow and some might not. Um, but remember, to survive an extinction event, burrowing is pretty useful. Uh, so when we think about burrowers and crocodilians, usually um, alligator does it. It's got a broad snout. Um, as it's got a scooped snout, and they use that to dig into the dirt. Um, and this uh, no-name croc uh, has that same form. And they, there's one in a burrow. Um, if, you look, if you go searching, you can find these burrows down south. Uh, animals that are long snouted, like the Borealisuchus um, and crocodilians or crocodilus, uh, aren't typically thought to engage in burrowing behavior, but actually they can. Um, this is a fun story of uh, these kids were playing in this watering hole, and then one day one of the neighbors was like, "There's something in there." Um, so they had to evacuate this watering hole, and this is like I don't know, like a 13 foot crocodile that had just been hanging out in there with these children. Uh, it's gone now. I think it went to a uh, sanctuary. Um, but regardless of whether these animals uh, were, in, um, some of them were burrows or some weren't, we do have burrows from the site. Uh, so I got to go out with an ichnologist who studies trace fossils, and we found this um, muddy layer and this sandy layer, um, and in it are these, are these fossilized burrows. So what happened was, the ground was all mud, um, the animals dug into the mud, and then some sort of storm or higher energy event brought all the sand in and infilled those burrows once 
the animals were gone, unfortunately, because it'd be sick to find one in there. So we do have evidence of burrowing of croc-sized animals at the site. Another thing they might be doing, is some of them might be living on land more, and some of them might be in the water more. Typically, people look at eye orientation on skulls, um, but looking at the most terrestrial living croc, Crocodilus rhombifer over there, um, I don't know. I don't. I just really don't know. Um, another thing is nocturnal versus diurnal. So maybe some of these were living in the, uh, were feeding in the daytime, and some of them were feeding in the nighttime, but. I haven't found a way to look into that. Again, with the living on land versus the living in the water thing, we can look at limbs. You'd think if you were on land, you'd have your limbs more under you, they'd be more robust and pretty thick. So this is the button tooth croc. Um, and the other one with the long snout, uh, if its leg were to be this length, um, it would probably be half as wide. So they have these really, really, really slender uh, this is a this is a thigh bone, ephemera. Uh, however, unfortunately, this this group, the three on the left, they just tend to have really thick legs, regardless if they're on land or not. So it's kind of obscuring what's actually happening. It's just something that has happened in their evolutionary history. Rude. Another thing is the teeth. Uh, we look at the we've got the button teeth in the one, and then the other croc has all these sharp teeth. Um, so maybe you might think one of these is a specialist and one of these is a generalist, but when I think about it, it's probably more like one of them is a generalist and one of them is a super generalist. So long-snouted animals are thought to, uh, long-snouted crocs are thought to generally eat fish, but it uh, turns out alligators are short-snouted and they do it just as well. They can actually eat whatever they want, whenever they want, including fruit. Uh, and then... What the long-snouted one with the thin teeth couldn't do, though, is it couldn't eat turtles. Sorry, Tyler. Um, but if you do look back here, the back teeth of living alligators are kind of rounded. They aren't as rounded as these ones. Um, but that means that that one croc could eat foods that it had to crush. Um, so what that makes it is probably what I call a super generalist. So it could eat everything and turtles and crayfish and stuff. Um, a final thing I like to think about um, is maybe they're behaviorally different, which allows them to occupy the space at the same time. Um, and using CT scans, we can look inside of the skulls of these animals. So this is a slice uh, down the back of the skull. And if you look at the shape in here, um, and I sit there for hours and I color it in, that's where the brain would sit. And it allows us to make these nice 3D models of the brains of these animals. So comparing the two, We've got Borealisuchus, and we have the other one. Uh, they're, the, they're not that different. Uh, and that's all. Um, if we look at um, evolutionarily how these fit, um, this Navosuchus, whatever it's called, animal, um, would fit in with this group up here. Um, you can tell that it is kind of stretched out in comparison to those. Um, and this one is kind of tall. Um, and it would be the ancestor, uh, ancestral to all the ones up there. But in general, the trends aren't that different. Um, and what we're finding is the ear shape and the skull shape, I mean, the, the ear shape and the brain shape kind of just respond to the skull shape. Um, so the brains aren't actually telling us very much about how they might be thinking, which is a bummer, but that's okay. All right. Um, with all that, here's my plug. They're a really good group to study a lot of things. Um, I'm keen to sensory systems um, and then also anatomy. So um, because they have a really good extant record and a really good fossil record, crocs are a really good group to study all of these. Um, and there's not a lot of people studying them because I don't know why. Um, they're also really fun outreach tools too. So I get to do a lot of outreach and um, you can't tell who's more excited, me or that guy. Uh, we're talking about what? what they might need to live underwater. So I'm showing him that his eyes are on the top of his head so it can scope the, scope the room. I got a lot of people to thank. There's two little slides of it. Um, and thanks for listening. And please come up and look at them.
Does anybody have any questions? Um, could you potentially go back to the slide where you have like the gradients of like where they're found along like north south in, in the US? Because it kind of seemed like there might be like a north south distribution of that known. Like, definitely it's Borealisuchus and like the unknown, what crock is this? Are there any like gradients and features that you see that you're like finding along like a, well, like a latitudinal gradient? Like, are they kind of. Do they, do they kind of, are we seeing just slightly different features about that they've been mistaken as each other before? Is there anything like that? Yeah, uh, kind of. Um, all these Borealisuchuses used to be called, similar problem, they used to be called Lydiasuchus, and that's like still being deconstructed because there is an animal called Lydiasuchus, and there are all these Borealisuchuses. <sighs> well, I guess it's more between like, is it Wanagenesuchus, the W1 up top, and yeah. all the Nova the new ones at the bottom. I mean, I think yeah. they're the, I think they're the same, but we got to leave it to the phylogeny. I haven't run the phylogeny on that one yet. You got to throw it to Nicholas. I can shout. No, we, it's recording. You're not allowed. Oh, I'm afraid of this. No. It's soft. Work. That's the whole point of the cube, right? <laughs> Is there a difference between the like amount of sense uh, um, like that? Is there a difference between the sensory nerve and the three main extant groups? Like, is one of them more sensitive than the others? Not you know? that I could detect from this. Uh, there have been some actual experiments where people test them, and they all seem to be pretty on a pretty extreme level. Because I was interested in like, do the more terrestrial crocs versus the more aquatic crocs differ, but not something that I could detect with mine and then the people who have done experimentation have detected with their studies. And which is your favorite? Just of like any crocodilian ever, what's your favorite one? Jesus. Uh, I mean, I named one once, that's pretty neat. It's called Viveron. Nice. Thank you for using Ornithodira. You're welcome. Um, have, I know you don't like dinosaurs. I mean, obviously. they're fine, they're just not as good. <laughs> have you considered using your techniques with Spinosaurus? Ha <laughs> If you see, the people who study Spinosaurus are very protective, and they won't necessarily give you the data you need to study Spinosaurus. So they keep asking the question and making the claims, but they won't share. Um, but yes, I have. Um, I've done this with five theropods, and I'll just tell you that any paper you read that says <laughs> that a Tyrannosaur could use its face like a weather vane to sense the wind direction, is wrong. Um, anything that you might read that says that they were using their faces to rub on each other for courtship is wrong. Um, they don't have very complex sensory systems. They look a lot like the lizards do. But Spinosaurus, I don't know. I, I do think it might be more complex than everything else, and I would like to look at it, but I got to get my hands on it. Same. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Were you able to do your topology study on, the, on your ontological specimens? Were the nerves sufficiently well developed that you could follow them and check the branching numbers? Great question. It's something I want to do. Not with the imaging method I showed you. Um, there's some cool uh, stacked microscopy methods that you can do that with. Uh, so essentially you stain the nerves and you take like a CT image but with a microscope. Um, and I would, it'd be so, it'd be super easy just to apply it to that. But I don't have the machinery I need yet.
When you look at um, other clades that show higher diversity in the extent in terms of tactile versus not, um, is there a lot of mixing? Is it mostly that it'll show subclades that are all tactile or all not tactile? Or does it mix in such a way that it suggests that because this is all soft tissue stuff and ontology that in fact this is a trait that can appear and disappear rather quickly in the fossil record? Yeah, so I can only speak to extants, you know, um, but across all of birds, it has happened independently numerous times. So parrots are a good one, probing birds are another one, and then uh, anseriforms, duck things can do it too. So it does appear uh, on its own. And whether archosaurs tend to be better at it, I don't know. Probably. Okay. Let's go. Um, if you want to come look at the fossils, I'll talk about them up here. Thanks for coming.